Today, the world is seeing more people being displaced than ever before. Millions have been forced from their homes by conflict or persecution. And that number just keeps soaring. One man whose job it is to deal with the crisis is William Lacey Swing. He's the Director General of the International Organization for Migration. The former U.S. Ambassador has held the post since 2008. And after a decade of service, he'll be retiring later this year. I sat down with him to get his take on the biggest humanitarian issues facing the planet. Director General William Lacey Swing. Sir, Mr. Ambassador, good to meet you in person. I'm not afraid to ask stupid questions. This might be a stupid question. As the Di Director General of the IOM, can I use the terms refugee and migrant interchangeably? I think uh, from IOM's perspective, uh, they are two categories, but we also look upon refugees also as migrants. But the vast majority of people on the move are not refugees. Every refugee is a migrant, but not every migrant is a refugee. I put it that way. That's the simplest definition I can give you. 2018, where are we right now? How big is the issue globally? I look at the map, Myanmar, Bangladesh, the Rohingya on the move, Burundi, hundreds of thousands of people on the move. Different reasons. On the one hand, you know, some places it's ethnic, some, some places it's just political with regards a leader. South Sudan, Libya, the list goes on and on. Syria still burns and rages. So there's all of this going, going on around the world. Is there anywhere in particular that's worse than everywhere else? Let me put it this way. There are more people on the move today than at any other time in recorded history, largely because of a de demographic phenomenon that the world's population quadrupled in the 20th century. So percentage-wise, international migrants are still about 3.5% of the world's population. But there are many domestic migrants also so you put the two together, 258 million international migrants and 750 million domestic migrants, you come up with a figure of 1 billion, which means that 1 billion of our 7 billion world are migrating in some form or another. Uh, the vast majority of these are migrating smoothly, easily, generally without great difficulty but you have a very perceptive way in posing that question because we also have more people forced to move than in recorded history also, certainly more than any time since the Second World War. Now, the drivers are quite clear. You just outlined them. We have at least nine or ten armed conflicts from the western bulge of Africa to the Bay of Bengal and South Asia. Uh, there is no prospect in the short to medium term to resolve any of these, unless I'm ill-informed. I don't know of any negotiations leading that direction. You have, in addition to that, you have natural disasters that we have all the time, whether it is flooding in Pakistan or Bangladesh, or whether it is the earthquake uh, in, in Haiti, etc. Uh, you also have climate change now uh, proving to be a factor. And you have the demographic driver, which is, for example, you have a global north aging quickly in need of skills and jobs to, to be filled. You have a largely unemployed youthful south in need of work. So there's an automatic uh, push factor, push and pull factor there that has to be taken account of. The median age in West Africa is 14. In Germany and Europe, it's 47. So that's very obvious. So all of that is going to mean that large-scale human mobility is going to be a trend for the rest of our century, along with urbanization. Now so. that you've been absorbed properly into the UN mm -hmm. as IOM, mm -hmm. why do you need the IOM if you have UNHCR? Why do you need UNHCR if you have the IOM? Don't they do the same thing? We, they're our traditional partner. We were virtually joined at the hip in 1951 to take European refugees ravaged by the Second World War to safe shores and new lives. Uh, but they are uh, the custodian of the 1951 Geneva Convention, which gives them what they call a refugee status determination. They deal only with the refugees, and then they have a convention on stateless persons. So refugees and stateless persons are their field. 
We are their partner, however, operationally, because when a migrant, uh, sorry, when a refugee is ready to move to another country that's prepared to accept them, the entire file passes to us. We do 400,000 medical exams a year. We do all the air transport, often, very often cultural preparation, very often language learning, so that when they go to abroad, we have taken care of all the details. And it's a close partnership. It's always worked well. We also do a lot of collaboration on migratory matters also, because right now we're doing joint interviews uh, in Libya to determine if a person is truly a migrant returning home, or are they perhaps a refugee who would have trouble if they went home. So we work closely together. Talking about a country like Libya, no easy task working in Libya right now, competing governments, right, split between East and West. It's no picnic in Libya, yet you're still doing the work, you're repatriating people. I was having a look at some of your donor funds. What I found interesting is that you have donor funds coming from the Europeans. A lot of it comes from the Europeans, you can correct me if I'm yes, wrong. Correct. You encourage migration. Mm -hmm. A lot of your donor funds come from countries where those democracies are telling their politicians, I'm sorry, we just don't want those people anymore. How do you square that? Where the money is coming from countries that are accountable to their mm -hmm. voters, where they're not too keen on migration, mm -hmm. whereas you're working to smooth the path for people to migrate. Right, right. Well, the thing is, we pursue our own objectives according to our constitution, and we cannot do any forced migration. We, we would never be involved with Frontex, for example, because they have a reputation of deportation. And we don't do deportation. We do voluntary return in a humanitarian way. But the European Union money that comes to us is used basically to try to save life, to try to keep people from putting themselves into the hands of smugglers, which is very, uh, we call them the traffic agents, the travel agents of death, which they are. We try to encourage them uh, if they're tired from the journey to let us take them home with money to get life started again so they go back with dignity. And if they are truly refugees, we put them into the hands of UNHCR, our traditional partner. So we have no problem squaring that uh, with the idea of saving life. And we are telling the African colleagues in the African Union, we're not trying to stop these people from going to Europe. We're trying to tell them if you do it, don't do it the dangerous way through smugglers. Do you have any sympathy for the nationalist, populist wave that's currently happening in many European countries where they're resistant to refugees and to migrants? Now, if there's, a, for example, a German village, population 50, and they have to accept 70 people of a different religion, color, and so forth, naturally, yeah. They might feel a little uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily make them racist or, or anything like that. Do you have any sympathy for the fact that there's something bubbling in Europe yeah. right now and it's taking a right-wing turn? Look, I think that governments have a responsibility to help people to deal with their fears. They do this through program, programs of public education and public information to explain why these people are coming, who they are, why they're coming and what they can contribute and explain to them how you do integration in a proper way. It's, it's a two-way street. But the populist nationalist movement uh, that you see through in many parts of the world right now, uh, there are three problems here. Number one, a lot of the countries in Europe that are populist, they suffer from what Javier Solano calls refugee amnesia. They've forgotten that our organization and UNHCR were founded to take them as refugees to safe shores. So there's a question of memory. Secondly, suffering from the fact that Europe, despite all of its efforts, still does not have a common, long-term, multifaceted uh, migration and asylum policy. The commissions have pushed hard to get this, but there are a lot of resistance there. It's like a train going down a track and the wheels have fallen off most of the wagons. There's a problem. And the third one, frankly, is a very psychological issue they have to deal with, which is for three centuries, Europe populated the world. Colonies, missionaries, transnational corporations. And today, because of the demographics and the low birth rate, they've now become a continent of destination. 
no longer send their people, people coming to them who don't look like them, they have maybe an accent, don't speak like they do, and may even practice a different religion or speak a different language. So that is a psychological adjustment that has not been made and needs to be made. And then they can help the people. What's been the biggest change during your 10 years mm -hmm. as head of the IOM? Compare the IOM in 2018 to the IOM 10 years ago. Yeah. When I came to IOM in 2008, it was very hard to get a prolonged conversation going about migration. There was very little interest. Today, people, that's all they want to talk about. That's the big change. And I'm, I think that's partly because of the, of the movements into Europe and elsewhere, the problems of, of the Rohingya in Bangladesh, the concerns in the Bay of Bengal and the Andaman Sea, uh, and, and so forth. So, so that has probably been the, the single biggest change. The other change is that IOM has grown along with migration. We have been riding the crest of a wave called migration. And I think migration is, has been the missing piece in the globalization mosaic. It's now firmly there and will stay there. So now, uh, I think our membership has grown from 124 to 169. We'll have a few new members coming in in June. Uh, our number of programs have grown, but we have continued to be the same proximity organization with 97% of our 11,000 staff being in 450 places overseas. And we want to keep it that way because that's where migrant hap migration happens, it's where we want to be. If I don't interview you before September, if I don't interview you again before September, this will be my last interview with you as Director General of the IOM. You're done in September. Mm -hmm. What comes next? <laughs> I always say to people that uh, I'm in transition. And they say, transition to what? I say, I don't know yet but I'm sure something will come my way. I've been so lucky. Can you imagine? How could one be more fortunate than I to 40 years of diplomacy, 10 years of UN peacekeeping, and 10 years working on a major issue globally called migration? Have you been proud of the work you've done over the past decade? I've been very proud of the work I've done, but, but I've also, and, and I, feel, I feel good at the end of the day, but I also feel a sense, uh, uh, an urge in me saying, I could have done more, I could have done better, and I never feel that the job is done. In that sense, there's always a little feeling of, uh, of, of dissatisfaction. But that dissatisfaction, right? I mean, ultimately, you can't stop no. Bashar al-Assad barrel bombing his people. You can't stop no. multiple African countries being so corrupt that people, young people, qualified people don't have jobs, right? So ultimately, there's a ceiling to what you do. Absolutely. Is that, I don't know, does it disillusion you? Uh, does it take the, the zip and the zest out of a lot of young idealistic people who join an organization like the IOM, who ultimately realize there's a limit to what they can do because ultimately the politics dictates fundamentally what happens? You know, everywhere I go and I travel 60% of the time, I find a lot of very hardworking people uh, getting very little recognition and very uh, inspired by what they're doing. I think their feeling is that, well, okay, maybe, maybe we can't solve the world's problems, but if I weren't here doing this work, how many more people would be suffering? I think that's the way they come in. So I'm very uplifted every time I talk to some of our people in the field. I, I'm a field person myself, and I often wish I were back in the field rather than being at headquarters. And you fly economy. I fly economy, yes. It's important. William Lacey Swing, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. All the Great best to you. see you. Thank you.